So this is lecture 17 of ECE 503. So in this lecture, uh, what we'll be dealing with is actually uh, probably one of the most important topics of this course, which is called the Fast Fourier Transform. So it's a computationally efficient version of the DFT. So what we've noticed over the last seven, 16 lectures was sort of a gradual buildup, starting with understanding what discrete time and continuous time signals and systems are, how we represent them in both time and frequency domains. So a variety of different tools like Z-transforms, continuous time Fourier series, continuous time Fourier transforms, discrete time Fourier series, discrete time Fourier transforms. Um, we talked about sampling. We talked a little bit about filtering. Um, and then various practical aspects of treating signals, representing them, manipulating them, processing them. And then finally, we talk about DFT, which is vitally important if you're dealing with embedded processors, microprocessors, or any sort of digital processing of signals, and you want to also look at them in the frequency domain in a dis digital manner. Now, if you use DFT in a brute force definition-like approach, you're going to be going through a lot of multiplies, a lot of adds, complex operations. And imagine if your DFTs are of the size of 4096 points or larger. What happens is, suppose on top of that, you're playing with something like a Raspberry Pi, um, ARM Cortex, or any one of these like embedded systems. You're going to run out of resources soon, right? Especially if you have to do a lot of these, you have to do a lot of these quick. So what we need to do is we need a tool. We need a way of representing the DFT in a computationally efficient manner. And so what we want to do is we want to look for patterns. We want to look for ways of seeing, OK, this operation called the DFT, what's so special about it? Is there some sort of symmetry that we can exploit to streamline the efficiency of this calculation? And the answer is absolutely yes. So up until now, what we've seen is this guy here, DFT de definition and the inverse DFT definition. But what we found is that the DFT and IDFT has both a symmetry property, right, this guy here, and it has a periodicity property as well. So this, this WN, so if let's say we shift it by N over 2, it's equal to minus WN to the K. And likewise, the periodicity, every N it's almost like we're rotating back to the original K, right? So we're going to take advantage of this. And so here's the trick. So there's a lot of steps and such. I'm just going to get right to it. I'm going to draw it. It turns out that if we exploit that's a little bit of a harsh term. Let's say we leverage. So leverage, OK? Periodicity and okay, symmetry, OK? What it turns out is that we can take a stream of data, x1, 0, x1, x2. And what we can do is the following. It turns out, and the devil's in the detail, so that's what I'm going to show in the slides afterwards, we can arrange it as a matrix. Okay, So we can arrange it by an L by M matrix of these elements. Okay, And then what we can do is several things. So we can stack this, let's say column-wise. Okay, We can take the FFT, uh, sorry, not FFT, DFT row-wise. We can then multiply by some sort of constant, which we'll, I'll describe in a minute. And then we can then take the DFT again 
column-wise, and then extract the data out row by row by row by row. OK, so everyone's like saying, all these lines, I give up, I surrender. What's going on? OK, and the answer is, this is what's going on. So let, let's, let's, let's do it in a nice graphical way. Hey, no. Ah, actually, yes, let's do that. This is what I would do. So again, let's take that stream of data. x0, x1, x2, x3. So let's say it goes all the way to x14. All right? So let's stack, let's create that metric, uh, matrix. Let's say we make a 3 by 5 matrix. And so let's make it column wise x0, x1, x2, x3, x4, x5. You get the point, right? Bless you. Now, what I want to do is I take these guys, right? So I stack them this way, column. Then I take each one of these rows, and I take the DFT, three-point DFT of each row. Okay? I do the same thing with the guy below. Um, What's the best way of drawing it? See, now my artistic ability is coming into question. Same thing here. And I take each, each one of these is a three point FFT, uh, DFT, sorry. Same thing here. And then what happens is I get the output of each one of these three-point DFTs. So yeah, a lot of lines. Okay. And then what I do is I pass this. Okay, that one I kind of messed up the drawing. Ah, I pass this through essentially some sort of multiplicative constant. I forgot what the exact constant was, but essentially it's some sort of complex value uh, w, right? w of n. And I think it was like k and q, but I might be wrong. And so all 15 outputs, so 3 by 3 by 3 by 3 by 3, go through this. They get multiplied by this constant. And then I take a five-point DFT, sorry, of each one of these guys, okay, produces an output. And then, how does the output look like? The output. This guy here, this is our frequency output, okay? But it's in matrix form. So what I've just done through this operation is I've done one massive DFT of a 15-point sequence. This output, what is its structure? I'm going to have to redraw it because, well, not redraw, but... The output looks like the following. The output will look like this, x0, x1, but capital X, right? So that's frequency. x2, Hmm. 
So the output is now row-wise. And then I take this row, then this row, then this row, and then this row, and then this row to create my output sequence frequency response of my input. So notice at the beginning, I was putting data column, column, column. And then through this process of taking, first of all, DFTs across rows, multiplying it by WN and some particular index, and then taking DFTs across column, 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 and then removing it row by row by row, I get my overall DFT. I get my 15-point DFT. You might say, oh my goodness, why in the world would you do something like this, right? Like, why don't you just take one big humongous DFT and get it done, right? Who in their right mind comes up with stuff like this? The answer is the number of multiplies and adds that you do at the end of the day. Notice that I have not used a DFT larger than five points. That's really powerful. I have not used a DFT more than five points. Let's look at that. So here's, in case you want to step by step in your slides, I have that here. So again, exploiting that symmetry. So just, just going before. So here's the, here's the motivation why we're doing this craziness. So for every value of k, the direct computation of xk involves n complex multiplications, which means it's 4n real multiplications and n minus 1 complex additions, which is 4n minus 2 real additions. That's a lot of multiplications and additions. Lots. Lots and lots and lots. Now, if we do it the other way, like what I was talking about, this guy here on slide 4, and we rearrange things into a matrix format, and we perform this operation, right? So where's the diagram? Yeah, this thing here on slide 7. What happens is computing it this way, Right? And you might say, where did the math come for this? The math comes from here. So what we can do is we can do row-wise or column-wise. So you can do it either way. If you stack it one way, you just have to be mindful how you process it the rest of the way. So if you stack it row-wise, your input data, you take your DFT column-wise, you multiply by the overall constant, then you take, so what it was, rows, column? Then you take row-wise DFTs, and then you remove data column-wise to get your DFT, right? So you just have to be careful which way you're doing it. But if you do the mathematics, what you end up getting is sort of this multi-step process that's described by the diagram that I just, and the example that I've just drawn. So mathematically, this is golden. How many, and in the end, how many multiplications and additions is this? n squared mults, right? And n squared, and how many additions? So, so initially, well, now what we've got is instead of n squared, now we have n, m plus l plus 1. Do people see that? So before, what we had, right, we, so we had 4n multiplications, n minus 1, uh, sorry, 4n minus 2 real additions. Now what happens is if you, if like, you know, the overall multiplications. So if we have to now do n points to do the DFT. So for every point we had to do, um, you know, the, the, the n complex multiplications, which is 4n real multiplications, and we had to do it for n points. So that's n squared, complex operations. Now we do it for only n times m plus l plus 1. So for instance, if let's say we had to do a 15-point FFT, DFT, sorry, DFT. So what's 15 squared? Very big. What's 15 times, what is it, 5 plus 3 plus 1? 
9, much smaller, or not much smaller, but quite a bit smaller than 15 squared. How about additions? Exact same deal. It's a lot less than compared to doing the brute force definition. So this is the motivation why we have this crazy formulation. We save on multiplies and we save on adds. So this structure here that I just presented, and this is the term that I was talking about, the uh, um, W of N, whatever your point FFT is, LQ. So depending on the position, you, you multiply by a different um, W, right? And so this structure here, surprisingly, uses far less resources than if you had to use um, just the brute force DFT definition. So, so looking at this, what happens is it might be complex, but it does afford us a little bit more resources, especially if you have a resource cons constrained um, platform. And now this is the point where I say, but wait, there's more. So what happens is most of you should have heard something called Radix 2. So really, I wish there was like a rock group called Radix 2. Like, you know, I've, like, you know nowadays, like, you know, like, I'm not sure how many of you do this, but uh, whenever I'm watching TV and I see a commercial, usually commercials play very jazzy, catchy tunes and stuff. And then I take my, 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 my smartphone and I'm trying to identify what song it is. And it's usually from some oddball indie group that has a really snazzy name and it has a really snazzy album name uh, as well. It would be cool if, like, you know, I'm not sure how many of you play music, but if you have a music band, I would love to see that for one of you guys to call your music band Radix 2 or something like that, you know. Anyways, I'm just putting, you know, just subliminal messages in all your heads. So, the wait but more part is the fact that suppose we now do Radix 2 representation. So, okay, so this is what I was telling you about row-wise versus column-wise. What, what I'm interested in is, let's say we do base 2 operations that, you know, 15 is not radix 2. So, essentially, radix 2 is anything that's a base 2 number. 4 is radix 2, 8 is radix 2, 16 is radix 2, it goes on and on and on and on. 256 is radix 2. So, anything that's 2 to the power of, that yields a number, this yields a very powerful representation when it comes down to creating this computationally efficient implementation. So what happens is we can create a fast Fourier transform approach if you have a base 2 number of points that you want to take the FFT of. And so the way it works is the following. Suppose I have this x of k, and here's my definition of my DFT. Okay, so nothing up my sleeves, you know. What happens is, let's break this guy up. Let's break this guy up into n even and n odd. Okay? So that's the first mathematical manipulation. Next, what we then do is we rewrite x of n. Okay? So what we do now is we do a change of base, uh, a change of variables, now to m, where now what we do is we still take the even and odd points of x, but now we do it according to, let's say, 2m and 2m plus 1. So I've done nothing, but I have to be careful how I change those variables. So I do the change of variables, I get this representation, I rename x2m as f1 of m. And I rename uh, x2m plus 1 as f2 of m. And what I have here, okay, what do I have? What I do is I take out w and k from the second guy. And what I essentially have is an FFT, a DFT of f1 and f2 of n. And that's what this guy is here. How is this useful? What happens is this has a very powerful property. What this tells me is that I can decompose. I can decompose the structure of x of k now into f1 of k 
and f2 of k and add them together, one of which is multiplied by wn to the k. When I have that property, what, what this tells me is I can decompose the output, this frequency output, into two sub-frequency outputs. Now, what can I do? I can take f1 of k and do the exact same thing over again. I can cut up f1 of k just like I cut up x of k. Same thing with f2 of k. Now I can decompose f1 of k and f2 of k into its own individual components. What can I do then? I can decompose those guys into their individual components. What can I do then? I can just stack downwards and decompose and slice and dice these guys ultimately until I get individual little what we call butterflies. What I can do essentially is I can take a two-point FFT and then feed that into a four-point FFT and feed that into an eight-point FFT and constantly feed it into a larger and larger and larger and larger FFT. That is the power of the FFT when it's radix 2. So each one of those things, those little diagonal things, oh, I love this. It's called an FFT butterfly. You know, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> trying to be funny. But it is really powerful because when we have this type of structure, the one big powerful thing, and I un underlined it here, and I have lots of exclamation marks, is that it scales. How many things in life scale? Not many, right? Like Wi-Fi networks don't scale very well, right? Um, hmm, what else? I'm trying to think of things other than wireless networks. But in general, this guy here scales very nicely. This guy here has one very simple structure that you can reuse, 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 and build up to create. And there are two different types of structures. So people talk about DIF and DIT. Decimation in frequency and decimation in time. And they both yield frequency outputs. So you might say, what does that DFT butterfly look like? It looks like this. This is what a DFT butterfly looks like if you do decimation in time or decimation frequency. Remember that the structure, remember x of k is equal to f1 of k plus what? w n to the k divided by 2 f2 of k. Right? And notice that in my DFT butterfly, I have two inputs going into it. One is initially multiplied by w n to the r, or whatever that constant is, then blah, 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 blah. What you've got is you take that multiplied b input, bring it over to the a input and add it to it, and that's one output, and then the a input is brought over to the b input after it's processed and also multiplied by minus one, to produce the B output. And then you stack these guys together in a manner such that at the end of the day, you get that computational savings and that and computational savings because you use fewer multiplies, fewer adds, fewer computational cycles, less resources, means also less power, means faster processing. So at the end of the day, when you stack them all together, you produce the DFT output, which is done by FFT. The other guy is just the opposite in terms of where you perform the multiplications of the minus 1 and the WN to the R. All right? So what, what ultimately you're doing, starting off, with this process here and how you divide things up into even and odd, you just sort of repeat, 
right? Split up into even to odd, represent as individual DFTs, repeat, right? Just like you do laundry. If it's still dirty, rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat. Of course, concrete is very difficult to uh, repeat and wash out. It's kind of bad once it solidifies. Anyways, so that's how you get these beautiful structures. In fact, on your textbook, I'm not sure, ah, it's a different textbook. But on your textbook, that's what you're going to find. You're going to find the FFT butterflies, right? So this is a powerful result. This is really important because in digital communications, OFDM, the reason why industry does OFDM than anything else, you have filter bank multi-carrier, you have polyphase filter banks, you can do any other implementation. And you know, there's a lot of professors that I know that sometimes trash talk me and say, why are you playing with OFDM? My thing is far superior, has better interference suppression techniques than your thing could ever have. And I said, how computationally efficient is yours? Eh. OFDM, the reason why industry goes after OFDM is because it's based on the FFT. It is way cheaper, more computationally efficient than any other sort of implementation of, uh, of a DFT out there. So that's why folks use this, because of the cost. And nowadays, you can get IP cores ready to make. You can get parts, components, you name it. This thing is a commodity. All right? So that's like my little soapbox stand. If you want to know more about the DFT, so I mean the FFT, your book goes in really high, like really deep detail about the FFT and the structure and lots of little mathematics that will take me forever to explain and to describe. But in sections 8.1.4.5 and 0.6, there's like whole volumes of descriptions of different types of FFT. Mostly Radix 2, but there are also things like Radix 4, right? There's a few other kind of less well-known techniques for implementing the FFT. But you should be aware that such a technique out there exists for implementing the DFT efficiently. All right? So from this lecture, what have we learned? From this lecture, what we have been exposed to is the fact that if you do the DFT brute force, you can do it. You can solve it. Mathematically, there's nothing wrong with it. But your computer might not like you. Right? Or your embedded processor might not like you. If you exploit the symmetry and the periodicity of your DFT, you can, in fact, be able to shave off computational cycles and make things more efficient using fewer multiplies and fewer adds by exploiting that symmetry and periodicity. If you make things now, the inputs, restrict them to base 2, Radix 2, you can take this thing to town and make it even more computationally efficient to the point where we have these beautiful FFT lattices, all these butterflies that, that are formed. One thing is, you might ask, what happens if your data is not Radix 2? Let's say your data is, oh, gee whiz, I only have 1023 data, right? 1023 points or samples of data, I can't have Radix 2. Answer, zero pad. Remember zero padding. Don't forget, your zero padding is going to be your best friend, right? Like, when in doubt, zero pad. Get 1024, make a great X2, and then apply your FFT. All right. So that concludes lecture 17. All right. Okay. So, no, honestly, honest to goodness, so the FFT...